Welcome. This webinar is part of the California Institute for Behavioral Health Solutions Continuum of Care Reform Technical Assistance. This project is funded through a contract with the Department of Healthcare Services. Additional assistance and support was provided by consultant Richard Connect and Corey Allen. My name is Kimberly Mayer. I'm Associate Director for CIBHS, and I will be moderating portions of this webinar. Today's webinar is Understanding California's Child Welfare System, a primer for mental health providers in small or rural county settings. We developed the webinar to serve as a reference for the behavioral health system and to give some historical overview to California's child welfare system. We recognize that there are sometimes differences from county to county in terms of structure and how each county child welfare system actually operates. It is now my pleasure to introduce the presenters for today's webinar, Richard Connect and Corey Allen. Richard Connect is a consultant and advisor to the Children's Health and Human Services community. He is a former chief operating officer and senior executive in both private and publicly based mental health and social service systems. He recently served as a transformation manager to the state of California providing guidance and system-wide technical assistance to the state's implementation of its youth and family shared management structure and associated reforms. He has published research on family-centered residential services and is a fellow of the Sierra Health Foundation's USC Marshall School Health Leadership Program. He's also the retired director of Placer County's highly regarded children's system of care. Corey Allen is a Deputy Director with the Department of Social Services in Tuolumne County with responsibility over Adult Protective Services, Child Welfare Services, Public Guardian, and Welfare Fraud. Corey has been with the Department for 20 years serving the public as a social worker, social services supervisor, senior analyst, and program manager prior to her current role. Corey earned her bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of California, Santa Cruz, and earned her master's degree in public administration from CSU Stanislaus. The bulk of Corey's professional work has been done in the realm of child welfare, where she has always had a sense of belonging and purpose. Uh, thank you, Kim. It's good to be with you today. We hope that this will be useful information for you as you work with CPS and child welfare partners in your work. As we go through our material, we hope at least four outcomes are possible for you. First, that you'll have an understanding about the key historical elements of child protective, foster care, and related welfare efforts. That you'll have an understanding of the purpose and role of current child welfare organizations and structures with a particular attention to small and rural county concerns. Thirdly, that you'll have an understanding of the relationship between federal, state, and county welfare efforts. And finally, that, that you'll have an increased recognition of some of the unique issues associated with service provision to youth and families from a small county perspective. We are indebted to two sources of information on our web and our content today. Much of the information is from the Child Welfare Information Gateway and its parent funders, the United States Department of Health and Human Services Children's Bureau, and from the California Center for Research on Women and Families. The effort known as the Continuum of Care Reform draws together a series of existing and new reforms to the state's Child Welfare Services Program designed out of an understanding that children who must live apart from their biological parents do best when they are cared for in committed nurturing family homes. Assembly Bill 403 provides the statutory and policy framework to ensure services and supports provided to the child or youth and his or her family are tailored toward the ultimate goal of maintaining a stable, permanent family and reducing trauma on all involved. Reliance on congregate care should be limited to short-term therapeutic interventions that are just one part of a continuum of care available for children, youth, and young adults. The bill is a wonderfully designed uh, piece of legislation, but definitely creates challenges for state and county agencies. As part of CIBHS ongoing work with the Department of Healthcare Services for CCR, CIBHS has developed this webinar for behavioral health care systems. This webinar is focused on providing a detailed overview and purpose of California's child welfare system. We recognize that many county child welfare and behavioral health systems are already collaborating and working together as joint efforts are underway to implement CCR and its related reform efforts. You can see that the small county will have dilemmas. So providing welfare and foster care services in small, close-knit communities does create unique circumstances. 
you'll see individuals wearing multiple hats, limited administrative support. And this is true for most human services departments. Child welfare is no different. Delivering human services of any kind in our small communities has special challenges. We hope today's webinar will speak to some of these unique challenges, particularly those around the partnership for CCR reform implementation. Let's begin with a short look at the history of child protection and intervention. Before the 19th century, there were no public authorities or involvement on the part of government in protecting or ameliorating neglect and abuse. Some of the more zealous groups removed children from their homes with little regard for parental rights. There was no court oversight. By the mid-century, awareness had grown about what constituted child neglect, and faith-based systems were often mobilized without government involvement to protect children. Some of these agencies still practice on the East Coast as children's aid societies, for instance, and like all providers, have evolved and adapted their care model and are active and involved partners in foster care services delivery today. By the late 20th century, federal and state laws existed and were sometimes implemented inconsistently. Perhaps the most egregious example is the relocation of large numbers of native youth, rarely for abuse or neglect, but out of a belief that children would be better reared in non-native homes. This is known, of course, historically as the Trail of Tears. The first real funding of child welfare efforts began around 1935 and linked the state's involvement to court systems for independent oversight. The country's first mandatory child abuse reporting laws began only in 1974. There are three levels of government support and oversight that allow the child protection and foster care services. Federal and state laws establish the legal, regulatory, and fiscal frameworks that govern the roles and responsibilities of agencies and organizations for children and families that enter and leave the child welfare system. There are now nationally recognized goals of all child welfare systems that are focused on safety, permanence, and well-being. The federal government itself is of course a complex, or complex organization, and it uses various vehicles to fund child welfare. Each of the four programs you see listed here is intended to assist state, county, city, and tribal governments, and the public and private local agencies to provide services through funding allocations, through policy direction, and information services. Known also as the Children's Bureau, the feds fund a number of programs that focus on preventing abuse and finding permanent placements for children who cannot safely return to their homes, and supporting independent living program services for youth who will or who have left the foster care system. The Children's Bureau also supports system improvement through a series of national resource centers regional implementation centers, and discretionary demonstration grants to states, counties, and community-based organizations. The federal administration offices have a significant role in building accountability in child welfare. Prior to 1997, there was little data-based or outcome monitoring. Today, Every state is responsible for monitoring its performance in seven outcome areas, and each of those has a number of sub-elements. Uh, some of those focus on the recurrence of child abuse or neglect, on the time spent in foster care before reunification occurs, uh, and of course also on placement stability. In California, counties can access a statewide clearinghouse known as Safe Measures to get monthly performance metrics. It's part of what's driven largely a 40% reduction in the number of foster youth and out-of-state placements in California since about the year 2000. There are four processes that federal authorities use requiring states to implement this oversight effort. There are quarterly data reporting processes that each county child welfare agency is responsible for. There's a county self-assessment process um, that's undertaken with its probation and its community-based partners. Uh, there's a case review process now where uh, all counties are responsible for reviewing a, a very in-depth and prescriptive um, 
uh, analysis of their uh, care delivery in the record. And finally, all of those processes roll up into a five-year uh, rotating a cycle of system improvement work. So, Richard and Corey, do counties uh, do any direct reporting to the federal government for any of these outcomes? Uh, no, Kim. Actually, the state typically aggregates all county information and makes statewide reports to the feds. So only right. in the cases of maybe a specific grant awarded to a county would there be independent reporting. Thank you. So California is one of about a dozen states that use a state-administered and county-implemented model. Other states have a state-administered and state office delivery system with no county-specific services. Each of California's 58 counties conduct its own child welfare services, while the California Department of Social Services, serving as a large administrative services organization, will monitor and support those counties through regulatory oversight, administration, and the development of program policies and regulations. Within that large state department, two divisions are most critical to youth and families, those being the Child and Family Services Division and Community Care Licensing. Additionally, the California Department of Social Services oversees most aspects of the county-delivered service modeling. Those administrative and regulatory processes include training, best practice implementation, uh, quality assurance, and our statewide data system, currently referred to as CWS-CMS. CDSS also has an independent office of ombudsperson, which investigates and attempts to resolve complaints made by or on behalf of children placed into foster care and also compiles all those complaints um, into an annual report to the legislature. All county child welfare workers are required to provide foster children with information about the ombudsman's office and its function. Counties also have a local ombudsperson. The state has recently championed innovative youth representation by employing a senior manager ombudsman who has lived experience in the foster care system. This may be the first in the nation action. One of the department's major, object, object, major objectives is to assure that all the various community-based agencies that serve foster youth are safe and offer a high quality of service. Um, the foster care uh, licensing oversight falls to the Division of Community Care Licensing within CDSS, and they provide oversight to the agencies listed here, uh, which include, of course, uh, foster family homes, small family homes, foster family agencies, group homes, community treatment facilities, transitional housing placement facilities, each of them have their own uh, set of licensing expectations. CCL, CCL also will, of course, uh, eventually provide oversight and licensing of the new short-term residential treatment programs. Related to the Department of Social Services, but independent, is the state's Child Welfare Council. A number of years ago, California identified a desire to bring together diverse leaders to provide independent advisory advisory services to CDSS and to its partners. The Child Welfare Council was born and today meets quarterly in a vibrant day-long conversation in pursuit of enhancements to the child welfare and related systems. So now let's take a look at the county level agencies. Under guidance and oversight from CDSS, each county delivers its own child protection services or CPS and welfare-related services. Most are often housed within the Department of Social Services. For some counties, it'll be a Department of Health and Human Services or a Human Services Agency. Child protection and the prevention of abuse and neglect is at the local level, along with foster care services, guardianship, adoptions, although in many cases contracted with the state of California. There's a county ombudsman and then compliance. 
Um, each county will also have additional processes for specific complaints outside of the ombudsman, which might include um, a grievance process for placement decisions or findings of a child abuse finding that would be, would be reported to the Child Abuse Central Index. So in my local county, we don't have an ombudsman, but we do have these additional processes. So can you talk a little bit more about the relationship between the county ombudsman and the local welfare authority? Sure. So the ombudsman is hired by or provided by the local Child Welfare Services Authority. Its role and intent is to provide an impartial and objective ear for consumers who have concerns. It reports to the county, but liaisons to the state ombudsman's office. So part three, what we want to do now is understand the structures of the federal, state, and county authorities involved. So let's talk about what actual services look like. All right. So each county has a 24-hour telephonic triage service. This busy schematic here outlines the major services and steps along the journey of a family in the child welfare system. The um, the Child Welfare Service Authority's actions are represented here in tan or taupe colored. The court's role is captured in the blue hued circles across the top. There may be, of course, local rules or agreements that adjust in some minor ways this general process, but it fundamentally looks the same in every county. The slides that follow and which we'll discuss now explain much of this process in greater detail. So each county has its own telephonic number for reporting suspected abuse. This part of the child welfare services system is known most often as emergency response, or ER. There's a standardized safety assessment system which evaluates the safety risk and the needs of children and families that enter the system. Most counties have a senior or a supervisory staff who reviews all of these decisions. Unlike decades ago, there are tools now used, and often uh, warrants are obtained in this process early before investigations are conducted to protect parental rights and assure due process. Thank you, Richard. So an alternative response also exists. Uh, differential response is what we refer to it as, and it was pioneered in the 1990s in Minnesota. It's been in use in California for nearly 15 years now. Depending on circumstances, a traditional investigation by a child welfare agency is not needed in every case. So while maintaining a fundamental commitment to child safety, differential response, or DR, is a strategic three-path approach used in about 40 counties in California. Path one, the first box, represents minimal risk, usually resulting in a referral for supports or services to a community partner. Path two focuses on voluntary involvement in services. However, in the interest of protecting the child, the authority of the court may be utilized. In path two, you'll see both a community partner and a social worker in, in many instances. Path three is most similar to what we know as the child welfare system's traditional response. Efforts are made to engage the family especially the non-offending parents or other protective adults, to preserve the connections between the child and other family members. Family maintenance is an additional system that we use, whereas ideally biological caregivers who would be willing to engage in assuring their children are safe and well would participate. Family maintenance, or FM cases, typically allow families to be together without detainment. The family maintenance funds that counties receive from the state are typically available for up to 12 months of service. Court-ordered FM services may be extended by six-month intervals and really could be continued indefinitely if it could be shown to the court that the objectives of the service plan can be achieved within the extended time period, and if the services 
can be provided within the county child welfare services allocation. Services are provided based on a case plan developed by a child welfare worker and with the family working together. Services can include, but are not limited, to counseling, emergency foster care where needed, respite care, things like emergency in-home in -home caretakers can be used, substance abuse treatment, domestic violence intervention, and parenting education. The list, of course, can go on and on. Family maintenance ensures that counties have an ability protect, to protect the minor while working with families to minimize dis disruption and trauma. Next, we move into family reunification, or FR. In cases where a minor child has been removed, counties seek diligently to reunify the family as quickly as possible. Family reunification services may also be extended beyond six months for a child under the age of three or a little longer, which is beyond 12 months, for a child who is over the age of three. If and I'll quote, the court finds there is substantial probability that the child will be returned to the physical custody of his or her parent or guardian within the extended time period or that reasonable services have not been provided to the parent or guardian. And that quote. Child welfare agencies are required to file a petition to terminate parental rights when a child has been in foster care for 15 of the past 22 months the service plan must be satisfactorily fulfilled for the child to be returned home. And then we have permanent placement. In cases where longer term out of home care is necessary, permanent placement or PP services apply. There are many forms of permanency. Permanent planning services begin concurrently at the beginning of a case to other services and are intended to assure the safe and stable care for minors placed away from their primary caregivers. Adoption is the preferred long-term permanent plan for children and youth. And we'll talk more about adoption shortly. Okay, when intact families cannot be successfully served, adoption is, often, is the often preferred uh, second plan, of course. To prevent completely severing a child's existing family connections, California adoption law now allows parents or relatives to enter into a post-adoption contract with the adoptive parent subject to court approval, wherein parents or relatives continue to receive information about and or maintain contact with the child. Examples of exemptions include a child whose parents have maintained regular contact where the child might benefit from continuing the relationship, a child who is 12 years of age or older and objects to being adopted, and if the adoption will interfere with the connection of a Native American child to his or her tribal community or the child's tribal membership rights. In some Native American tribes, adoption with termination of parental rights can mean the child loses its citizenship, for instance, in the tribe, along with various benefits. Timeliness to adoption is a major statewide improvement in the, uh, in the last decade and contributes to stability and well-being more often than not. Aid to adoptive parents is a funding source which supports youth in and after adoptions. Historically, these are counseling, case management, or community supports. California partners are excited and of particular interest uh, to note that um, California is one of eight uh, sites that will be piloting uh, adoption competent clinical services, recognizing the need for specialty mental health intervention throughout and following the adoption process. There are already 2,500 California practitioners across the state who are signed up for this training and all will be uh, certified by the end of 2018. So as you can imagine, being in foster care can be quite stigmatizing. One way this can be greatly mitigated is by having caring extended family members provide care and supervision of the victim. California youth in dependency are placed into kinship settings in approximately 45% of all out-of-home cases. This is a significant improvement since 1998, and this is due largely to timely location and connection 
making with extended family members. Guardianship, similar to adoption, does not provide the same level of permanency that is afforded through adoption. But guardianship can facilitate continuity of formal and legal ties to the child's biological family, which may be in the child's best interest and is often considered. Legal guardians have authority to make decisions on behalf of the child that a biological parent would make, but they do not have a legal obligation to support the child financially. The biological parents continue to be legally required to provide financial support for that child. If a relative becomes a guardian, the child welfare and dependency court cases may be closed. Through the Kinship Guardian Assistance Program, or KINGAP, the relative may receive ongoing financial assistance for the child in the same amount that the child would have received had they resided in a foster home. Now, most non-related legal guardians receive similar financial assistance under the state AFDC foster program, and they remain under the supervision of the court. Joining many other states based on widely celebrated national research from the University of Chicago, California now makes foster care status and its supports available to our youth aged 21 with some support. So it goes all the way to the age of 21 with some supports continuing beyond that. This is now used by about 7,500 youth statewide and maybe one of the factors in California's declining arrest rate in the last seven years. Okay, let's talk briefly about the Indian Child Welfare Act. Tribal partners are critical to successful foster care for youth with native identity. ICWA, or the Indian Child Welfare Act, provides unique supports and is intended to assure native youth are served in a fully culturally proficient manner. Child Welfare Services County partners and tribes work together to assure cultural and ethnic supports are accessible and available to the youth and family. While California has many native tribes, there are few tribal courts. Let's talk for a moment about uh, some of the Child Welfare's outstanding partners in dependency because no county agency does this work alone. I could not agree more, Richard. Formerly known as the Administrative Office of the Courts, the Judicial Council is the statewide administrator of county court services. Under the leadership of the Chief Justice and in accordance with the California Constitution, it delivers guidelines to the courts, makes recommendations each year to the governor and legislature, and adopts and revises the California rules of court in the areas of court administration, practice, and procedure. The California Welfare and Institutions Code, Section 300, provides a legal basis for juvenile court jurisdiction and authorizes the court to remove children from the care and custody of their parents if such action is necessary to keep them safe. That is the dependency system. Large counties may have two or three juvenile officers while well, medium and small counties will have a single judge or commissioner who also shares other duties. The state constitution provides that all parties to a child welfare services proceeding have legal advice. County departments have an attorney assigned. The court assigns a lawyer for the youth and family members may bring their own counsel or can have one appointed at taxpayer cost. In most counties, these advocates work collaboratively to help the youth and family as they navigate the system and to quickly reunify without additional trauma. Occasionally, dependency cases can and do become adversarial. A critical partner in uh, protecting uh, children and families, of course, is the Juvenile Probation Department. In addition to local law enforcement, county probation departments and juvenile courts work with local school districts and child welfare and behavioral health departments. 
County probation departments are also responsible for operating juvenile halls, camps, and ranches. At the state level, the Division of Juvenile Justice maintains three secure facilities and a conservation camp for lower risk offenders. For example, a 15-year-old arrested for the first time for skipping school might be counseled and released by the court. At the other extreme, the most serious cases may be directly filed on or remanded to the adult criminal system. Most of the time, however, law enforcement refers the arrestee to a county juvenile probation department for services. About half the time, the probation department either closes the case or prescribes informal probation or a diversion program, including educational services, community service, or restorative justice. More serious cases warrant a juvenile court hearing, but judges have a range of options short of committing youth to a county facility. Of the approximately 150,000 juvenile arrests made in the state in 2011, about 11 percent resulted in confinement and fewer than 1 percent resulted in uh, commitment to a Department of Juvenile Justice state facility. A 2007 reform effort permitted counties to commit only the most serious offenders to state facilities. So between 2007 and 2013, the year-end number of juvenile offenders in those institutions and camps fell from 2100 15 to about 650. The share of youth in the Department of Juvenile Justice um, care for homicide, for instance, increased from 5% to 12.5% and for assault from 32 to almost 40%. A subsequent reform gave counties responsibility for all offenders released from DJJ, resulting in a drop in state parole numbers from t just under 2,500, of course, to zero between that same time period. One contributing factor is that between 2007 and 2012, the juvenile arrest rate fell by about 42 percent, its lowest level in decades. This trend mirrored a general decline in felony arrests uh, and felony arrest rates for young adults. Here's a quick look at some of the uh, big picture probation demographics. There are uh, 27 juvenile detention facilities and 54 camps run by county agencies in the state. Of the nearly 40,000 youth with open uh, delinquency cases, uh, nearly 80 percent are for 602 offenses uh, that result in community supervision. And in the juvenile probation um, world, the rate of foster care and group home use uh, has declined by more than 50 percent in the last decade. So let's talk about partnerships with community, nonprofit, and others who support and intervene with child welfare services and foster care. Welfare agencies, fact, yeah, other critical allies, right, helping in those services. And in that's the right. That's right. <laughs> Thank you. You know, a growing body of research has shown that family and youth both do better when someone with lived experience can walk with them through the system helping to navigate and support them. So these bullets that you see show some of the roles played by youth and parent partners. These partnerships are either purchased by the agency, by a contract, or in some cases employed directly by the department. Increasingly, there is awareness that foster youth most often need intervention or support from the mental health community to effectively cope with their trauma. All foster youth are automatically eligible for Medi-Cal and under recent KDA settlement agreements and the continuum of care reform effort, all youth are screened for mental health needs. Many are assessed uh, additionally and found to meet medical necessity criteria to receive behavioral health or mental health care. Since 2014, the county mental health plans have been invited to coordinate care with regional or local managed care companies who were awarded contracts to deliver care to less acute beneficiaries. Counties uh, and their managed health plans, along with managed care companies, have agreements in place which are intended to assure timely assessment and referral and care coordination for all Medi-Cal eligible youth, including foster care. Substance abuse services are historically not well funded at the federal or state level, especially for young people. There are limited funds and most counties have some uh, substance use disorder services available, usually accessible via the mental health plan. So is uh, Medi-Cal eligibility the same for foster youth as those currently in the system, for former foster youth as those in the system? Yeah, that's a great question, Kim. Generally, the answer is yes. Former foster youth qualify for all of the same services, provided the youth meets clinical criteria or demonstrates need. 
Once they've turned 18 years of age, the adult mental health plan will have responsibility for the care and services of the young person. For youth remaining in the child welfare system under AB 12 or the non-minor dependency, which we talked about a few minutes ago, counties will have local policy and guidance as to how that young adult's care will be managed. And of course, there are other community partners. Um, those partners can you can see in front of you here: CASA, court-appointed special advocates, uh, partners through schools. Um, you can see the list goes on. AmeriCorps is another one that you don't see listed, but that does include both child abuse prevention and other supports to our services. He, each of these entities provides a mandated and often valuable adjunctive role to the protection and safekeeping of our youth. The scope and reach of these services will vary by county, but often mental health clinicians working with CPS involved youth will want to be aware of the partnership and resources available in their parallel health and social services systems. In the last 15 years, many improvements have been implemented and are resulting in positive enhancements for youth and families. So let's shift here and talk about a few of those. Since 1997, counties and state agencies have developed and implemented a number of evidence-informed or evidence-based improvements, things like Safety Organized Practice, or SOP, wraparound, child and family teaming, and so many others. They all share a major objective of assuring authentic engagement with the biological family and service planning that seeks to connect the youth and family to their natural supports, where they can be the most effectively served. Resource family approval, or RFA, enhancements are intended to assure any caregiver is fully trained and supported. The ICPM will be a cross-system guide which captures how staff in all service sectors work with families in a culturally responsive, a family-centered, and a strength-based manner. California will be the first state in the country to have a full system-wide core practice model that is integrated. So of course, can't do any of that without some funding sources. It takes a shared approach of federal, state, and local financial resources to fund adequate welfare services. The federal ASDC foster care program is funded in part with Title IV-E funds, which pays for placement or board and care. Foster children are also categorically eligible for Medi-Cal. Children who do not meet the eligibility criteria for federal foster benefits are eligible for assistance under the state foster care program or the CalWORKs program if they're placed with a relative. The federal system is now more than 20 years old and badly in need of reform, but consensus has proven challenging for a variety of reasons. Yeah, it sure has. Uh, lots of folks trying to fix the funding sources in Washington. Hopefully we'll get there in time. As we wind up, let's take a look at um, a part nine, our current service utilization and some of the, um, the big picture demographics. In recent years, there are about uh, 40, I'm sorry, 400,000 actionable referrals processed by uh, county welfare authorities across the state, representing about 68% of all calls. The other 32% of those calls um, are not uh, subject to investigation. They're informational or um, not focused specifically on a youth who might be at risk. There are currently about 63,000 open dependency cases in the state, and that number has dropped by about 42% since the year 2000, although in the last couple of years it has plateaued. There are, as um, Corey mentioned earlier, about 7,500 uh, youth in the relatively new non-minor dependent status around the state, and there are about 12,000 youth who are waiting for adoption. Each year the state places about 6,100 adoptions uh, successfully. Mm -hmm. Most of the youth, uh, of course, in California are in the state's largest four or five counties. So, Corey, this is Kim. I wanted to get your um, feedback on, in terms of your experience uh, as a, a experienced uh, welfare director in a small county, 
from some of the things we've talked about today, can you tell me some of the biggest challenges that you face in terms of, of uh, running your child welfare system in your county and some of the different categories that we've spoken of today? Yes, I sure can. Um, some of the challenges is in resources. We have difficulty in a small community without a feeder college in recruitment, for instance. So maintaining a, a viable, robust staff can be a challenge. Um, it means that managing our cases takes uh, a little extra effort by a larger group of people because a brand new worker needs that added support until they're competent. Um, that would be one of our largest uh, challenges. How about in terms of access to community-based organizations to provide some of the supports for, um, for ch uh, children in the child welfare system? Um, small, a small county like Tuolumne County does have limited um, outside support. We do have, for instance, one parenting educator. Um, we have private clinicians that can provide support, oftentimes don't take Medi-Cal. Um, and then, you know, working with our local behavioral health partners, just making sure that um, there is enough resource being provided to that agency as well to see and support all of our kids. Thank you. It just helps to hear that perspective as we look at this system statewide. So um, we want to let you know that we do have some additional resources you can share if you go to our website with um, the KDA has a number of different CCR webinars and other KDA webinars we've done over the past couple of years. We also have a CCR website um, which is also listed on your slide. And with that, I want to thank you so much for being a part of this today. My, uh, the contact information for myself, for Kimberly, and for Kelly are listed here. And if you have any questions from this presentation, uh, we have a, a, an email address here which you can send to, which is ccr at cibhs.org. And once again, I want to thank Richard and Corey for their great work today and, and sharing their information about the child welfare system with a small county perspective. Thank you.